There we go. All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to FlexRx episode four. We're gonna talk about fitness, learning, and enduring on our way to excellence. So we're gonna be diving in this week. I'm excited for the topic I got going on, and we're gonna go live in Instagram as well. So the topic that I have today, we're gonna be talking about my takeaways from the book Atomic Habits. Um, So your boy is a very, very slow reader. I realized that my speed of reading is about 30 pages per hour which is not very fast, but we still are committed to reading in 2024. uh, And I'm excited to keep that going. And I'll talk about some of the books that I'm going to be reading next. So we're going to get into the first topic. um, And then this is where we're going to start the the video clip. So the topic for today is going to be my takeaways from the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. So highly recommended book. Um, Shout out to Head Assistant Coach in HFP, Brandon, for, for kind of putting me on for this book and reading it. And it's very, very, uh, I think this book is tremendously effective in terms of if you want to make habits, in terms of doing something that you want to accomplish, a lot of people really benefit from Atomic Habits in terms of fitness goals. And then for me, in terms of reading goals, in terms of business goals, there's a lot of good stuff here that is not just fit into one singular uh, domain, like fitness, business, etc. It's very applicable skills and routines that can be used to pretty much to anything you set your mind to. So that's why I really, really enjoyed this book. Um, So let's go over my 18 takeaways. Number one, the first takeaway that I have, my first takeaway, and so a lot of these are going to be quotes from the book, but takeaway number one is going to be, um, what he said in the book is, I believe I accomplished something just as rare. I fulfilled my potential. So this is James Clear talking about his baseball career. And I thought it was really interesting. And I thought that this was very um, useful for a lot of people in terms of like, what are we trying to accomplish? Are all of us going to become professional baseball players if we set our minds to it? Not necessarily. But I found this very useful for me in terms of like, what are we looking to to like positively reinforce? And it's typically going to be hard work. So let me share over the, the Jamboard which apparently Google told me is going to be going away soon. So anybody have a whiteboard, let me know which one I should use. So James Clear said, I believe I accomplished. Something just, just as rare. I fulfilled my potential. And what I liked about this quote Again, this was, uh, I think James Clear was talking about he was a baseball player early in his life. Uh, and I think that he like didn't go pro or he didn't play after college, but he wasn't a great, great player back when he was in um, in high school or so. He actually had to really, you know, work hard at becoming very good at, uh, at baseball. And so it took a lot of training. It took a lot of him making the habit of training and uh, showing up consistently and learning the game on a deeper level. And so for him... He was very proud that he just felt that he maxed out like what his physical attributes allowed him to do. And so I think that this should be the goal for most people rather than like, okay, did you did you win the game or not? Maybe the other team is more talented than you, but you pushed yourself. You worked as hard as you can. You did uh, you did your hardest effort and you showed up in a strong way, just like in the gym or like a powerlifting meet. Let's say like you're on year five of training and you're in a bodybuilding show and you don't place. But the person who beats you is like 15 years deep. But you, you, you did the thing. You got as many as you could. You got the controllables controlled. You just can't, you can't outwork 10 years of, of more time in the game. So I think that this should be the target. And that was one of the takeaways that I got from this book that I just really, really enjoyed. My second takeaway, and this one may be, you may have heard this quote plenty of times before, um, but it was put in the book. And I think it's a really useful one too. Um, so 1%, 1% better daily is 37 times better in a year's time. So when people talk about, um, and let's talk about gym specifically. We're going to talk gym specifically. So 1% better daily is 37 times better in a year. And this is why when I've seen people go through like, you know, uh, fitness programs, they're like, oh, I only, uh, I only added one rep this week. I only added five pounds this week. I didn't add 20 pounds in terms of my bench press PR. But the thing is, you stretch that out long enough. And if you're hitting a PR every week in a certain exercise, this 250 pounds you're going to add over the course of that year. It's just staying in the game. One rep added, let's say every week, is going to be, you know, four reps per month. You can probably increase the weight that you're training with for the same amount of reps 
probably every four weeks, every month. So also you're going to add 60 pounds in your, on that exercise. So these little, little wins, which is often all we're able to do is just like really, you know, pull in these small W's. These lead to big leaps of progress and let's take on any big project. So I run a lot of retreats with HFP. Hey, shout out to healthy flex prescription. I'm putting on a retreat very shortly. We just finished our internal retreat last, last week. You don't just knock out a whole retreat in one day, just like you don't write a whole book in one day. This is something that probably took years, but the way that it happened is making the most of every single day or every single week. For me, putting on a, an event with our HFP clients, we're going to be in the Spooky Mountains, excited about it. But it's like, where are we going to eat? What hikes are we going to do? Uh, what day are we going to go? How is the team flying over there? What airline are we going? Um, what do we need to stock at the HQ? Where is HQ going to be? But like, if I take these seven tasks that need to be done and I just knock off one per week at a time, eventually the thing happens, but it isn't just something you knock out in one day. So a lot of people too, when it comes to fitness, they're like, man, I didn't, I have 135 pound bench press today and they expect tomorrow to bench 315. No, to hit 315 and bench, you need to first hit 185, 190, 225. Same thing in weight loss. You're not just going to wake up and be 30 pounds down. It's going to take losing the first pound, then the second, then hit five. So a lot of times we can get fixated on that end goal, but it's the little goals that we could contribute on a daily basis, on a weekly basis that add up to these big leaps of progress. Um, number three, number three takeaway from the book, Tom Cabins by James Clear. Number three is going to be focus on systems, not goals. And the quote that I like from the book is, you don't look at the scoreboard all game long. So I just thought that was a really good depiction or a really good visual of kind of like, you know, goals are cool and everything. But um, I mean, Nicole have had this conversation a couple of times, but like a lot of people um, we'll celebrate the act of setting a goal. I want to have a $5 million business this next year. And everyone's like, good, that sounds really hard. But sometimes we can get into a situation where like, I want to run a, a marathon, clap, clap, clap. I want to, um, I want to bench press 405, clap, clap, clap. And we sometimes forget to, that the reason these goals are cheered on for setting is because it's a commitment to the hard work to be done. It's not just the goal that we set. It's the hard work that goes into achieving that goal. And that's why it makes it such a beautiful thing of having hard goals because it takes hard work. And that's why a lot of things are respected because I think across all cultures, we respect hard work. Um, and so that being said, when we, we um, in this case, like focusing on systems, not goals, it's kind of like if we're so fixated on just the goal and not what we're actually doing, the system in terms of like basketball, if you're not focusing on putting the ball in the net, but you're just looking at the scoreboard, the scoreboard is going to stay at zero. It's like our goal is to hit 50, 50 points. But like if you forget to dribble the ball and train those systems of scoring a basket, then you could be, you know, wasting a lot of mental energy or just not allocating it properly. Because when you and the kind of the standpoint or like the, the point James Clear was trying to make is um, to get the outcome, you need to just make strong systems. When the systems are your focus, the outcome comes. When the outcome is all you're fixated on and focused on, then like the action can kind of be forgotten. So that's where I feel like it's important because sometimes, especially I guess in the culture of like, I mean, American culture, I guess I would say, um, sometimes the meme is uh, we're always setting goals. We're always trying to achieve, achieve, achieve. Um, but sometimes it's like, we don't just want to be cheered on for setting a goal, but cheer on the systems. Cheer If you want to run a marathon, clap for yourself and hitting that first mile ran because you won't run a marathon without hitting that first, uh, that first run. Number four, Winners and losers have the same goal. This is kind of just like more background for, for number three. Um, and that's just like, yeah, winners and losers have the same goal, but it depends on the strength of their systems, their strategy, and the actions taken. So again, it's like, don't get fixated on just goal setting, but like system setting. How are we going to get there? In HFP, we have a focus on like a lot of people want to lose, let's say 15 pounds of body fat. But if we're just fixated on losing 15 pounds of body fat, we got to do what's, you know, we only live at one time and that's in the moment that's in the right now. Um, and so we have to do something with our hands. And so we have to focus on the actions and then we'll get to that goal. Um, next up. So in HFP, kind of where I was going, it was, uh, we, we focus on our system. It's called seven, four, one, seven days, logging your nutrition, being within hundred calories of the calorie target, four workouts per week and show up to your check-in or check-in. 
Um, as long as we focus on that system and building a win streak, we're going to hit the goal eventually. Number five, achieving, this was a cool one. Achieving a goal is temporary. You cleaned your room. But if you still have messy habits, it will be a mess again. So this kind of goes into, um, again, systems. So if you clean your room, but your system is still that it's going to be a mess again, like you have a temporary solution. But if you focus on a system where, okay, every Monday, 9 a.m., or no, <laughs> cleaning your room. So Monday at 6.30 is going to be, I drop, drop everything, 15 minutes, you're going to clean my room. And if that's your system on a weekly cadence, then it never actually gets messy again. That's focusing on a system rather than just like, okay, I'm just going to do the thing now. So it's just going to be a temporary solution. So this also comes with when it's in fitness. It's like, I'm just going to do a 30 day program. And like, I'm going to, I'm going to fix everything in 30 days or less. You may lose five, may lose 10 pounds, but then like, what do you do after there? Are you just going to be back in the ocean floating with the waves and just going where things take you? Or like, what is your system from there? So it's important to focus on systems that also are sustainable for you. You can keep having that long-term success. Number six, my sixth takeaway from the book, Atomic Habits. Number six is going to be, <laughs> man chews fingernails a lot, gets a manicure. Told he has beautiful nails, starts valuing, valuing them, stops chewing them. And this I found interesting. So some uh, a person in the story chooses fingernails a lot, something that I think he wanted to stop doing. He got a manicure, totally was beautiful, had beautiful nails, starts valuing them, and then he stopped chewing on them. So he kind of took pride in that thing. So took pride in that. Um, so this is just kind of something like you can maybe be a strategic partner with somebody, like kind of compliment them. It reminds me a little bit of the, the Gandhi quote, uh, be the change you want to see. And so maybe it's also... Uh, giving someone the compliment, positively reinforcing something, and that can help people, you know, start valuing it to a greater degree or just taking pride in something. Like if I said, like I saw somebody um, <laughs> just scrolling social media, I was like, oh, that person has nice eyebrows. It's like, you can tell they take care of it. And then so if you positively reinforce that, if I give a compliment, like, hey, you're taking care of your eyebrows, nice eyebrows or something. I don't know, you plug it or something or like you wax it. I don't know. Um, your boy doesn't do the greatest job. Um, but with that being said, I found it interesting because like with this story, it's just like we can really value things that we are positively reinforced for from. And so that's how we like start taking pride in them. So we can even be in the way we dress. Um, if there's like something that you you want to improve and you start dressing a certain way, like you wear tighter sleeves. Now you start, you know, uh, identifying with someone with you know big arms. So you're going to make more of those actions more in alignment to those things you value or take pride in. Number the next one, seven. Seven is habits are, I love this one, are simply reliable solutions to re, reoccurring or recurring, whatever, we'll go with this one, problems in our environment. Habits are simply reliable solutions to reoccurring problems in our environment. I love this because it just talked about like, what is the basis of the developing habits? It's usually there's a problem that we want to make a, a habit for, and then there's kind of that solution. So let's say um, if it was smoking, um, some people drive, like why does the habit of smoking even start? Because some people feel a relaxation from it. And then that becomes a habit for getting into a relaxed state. Um, be that what it is in terms of negative health outcomes, but that's kind of why those habits start. There's usually a problem uh, that consistently occurs and then kind of we get associated with a certain solution. So in terms of fitness, having the habit of, of training on a, a weekly basis, on a routine basis. So the, the problem is I don't want to not be strong. I don't want to um, have my one rep max being less than going up a stair up the, up the stairs. I want to have strong. I don't want to have not strong bones. So these are some problems. So we want to have that habit uh, occur. And so these are kind of the ways uh, to like why are habits actually important. Because it's, it's ways we systemize solving reoccurring problems. So that is going to be number seven. Now, the next one is going to be number eight. So this is a quote from Carl Jung. And what Carl said was, 
I love this one. This is probably one of my favorite takeaways. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Bars by Mr. Carl. So it is until, until you make the unconscious conscious, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So sometimes we have these tendencies and I think um, um, this is really cool in terms of charisma. So we just had our internal retreat and we did a piece on charisma. Like what is charisma? This is something that Alex from Mosey broke down and made it a little bit granular because when it's this thing that people have or they're not, oh, that person's lucky. They're so charismatic. But it's like, well, what does that mean? And I like how Hormozzi started to break that down. It's like not would nod when someone speaks, address people by their name. Um, it is smile when you walk into a room, greet other people. Um, and then also, I think um, Robert Chialdini has spoken on on these things too. Kind of like, how do you make a positive impression? You be friendly. You smile. You laugh at people's jokes. If I say a really bad joke and people laugh, I'm like, wow, I like that person. So that I thought this is really useful in the way that when we make charisma uh, or likability, when we make that now actionable and we make it a conscious effort, now we can actually improve that thing. So same thing with like, if you have negative habits, the first step is being aware, like tracking your nutrition on MyFitnessPal. If you start tracking uh, what you're eating, you made it conscious. Now everything is a conscious decision. Now things are conscious inputs. We have seen people in HFP lose 10 pounds before we even started day one. Just because the homework before the program starts is just track your normal eating, don't change a thing. And people tend to lose weight because it's just they make the unconscious conscious. So when people say, how do I lose weight? What is the first step you would recommend? I would say just start logging your food. Because as Mr. Carl said, make the unconscious conscious. Number nine, we must first become aware of our habits before we can change them. It's kind of a follow-up to the previous one in terms of, yeah, you have to become aware of it. So with everything is awareness is the first step, just being aware of the decisions we make, start having objective things. So let's say, let's say finances, you want to improve your finances, your budgeting, you're like I don't have money to invest left at the end of the month. And then you, what would you do? You build awareness to the decisions. Where is this money going? How much am I taking in on a monthly basis? How much is going out? What is my car payment? What is the mortgage? Um, and then you start finding, oh, for me in 2020, it was like, why is 60% of my, my income going to Uber Eats? Maybe there's something here where I can make better decisions to get those better outcomes. But I wouldn't have known that unless I had that data staring me in the face. Same thing when people, you know, have to log the Pop-Tarts. They're like, dang, these two Pop-Tarts were 400 calories. That was just a little snack I had when breakfast was also an actual meal. And that was 400 calories. So again, make the conscious conscious. And that's the first step. So logging, tracking, a lot of those things. When the data stares us in the face, that's going to be useful for us to make those changes. This is one that I, we started implementing in HFP with me and the coaching team. Implementation, implementation, intention. Implementation intentions. So this increased... So let's go 35% to 91%. People got their workouts in. So I just said it in a different way. But when we set implementation intentions, this helps people just like commit to their, their commitments a lot on a stronger basis. So what is what is an implementation intention? So pretty much all it is, is in the case in the workout context is I will work out on what day? at blank time at blank place. And we use this strategy a lot in HFP. And probably <laughs> we may have some HFPers listening live and they may have even heard me say this in setting goals or one of the HFP team members saying this in terms of setting goals, implementation of intentions. So let me give you an example. If I say, hey, I want you to work out four times this week. It's like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I have seven days. I can probably figure it out. No, no, no. I want you like, what, what day are we going to do our next workout? Um, oh, uh, tomorrow I have time at like 7 a.m. Okay, so 7 a.m. tomorrow, what are we working out? Uh, let's do upper day. Okay, so tomorrow, what gym? I'm going to go to LA Fitness. Okay, so tomorrow, 7 a.m., you're going to be at the gym, LA Fitness, um, 
and you're going to get your workout in. Okay, cool. And then we do the same thing for the other ones because now it becomes so much more real. You've already visualized it happening. And a lot of times that's what it takes. And we saw this in that statistic. It increased by, if we're using relative uh, relative risk or absolute risk, it went 30, 31% to 91% or so, 35% to 91%. So that's like a 60% relative, I think that is, or absolute. Or we could say, if we want to clickbait you, a almost 3x increase in people getting their workouts done. Um, but that shows how powerful it is just to set the intention and just start to visualize the thing actually happening. Hey, I want to eat better. But what does that mean? So if we get a little bit more specific, what does healthy eating mean to you? Uh, eating less junk, eating more fruits and vegetables. Oh, okay, cool. So do you have fruits and vegetables in your house? Not really. I have com- apples like on the counter. Okay, cool. So like, let's go to the store. Let's grab some bags of salad. Can you have a salad tomorrow? Okay, cool. So now we start making these kind of like big concepts, just like hosting a retreat, just like a big project you're working on. Now I make it into little step-by-steps and we get very specific. Now the things are more likely to happen. So this is something I've been trying to apply in terms of you know goal setting and make things very very tangible and very um, reasonable to actually accomplish. So being more specific and kind of getting that visualization accomplished. Number eleven. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. I just kind of explained the above, but I'll put it in what I have. I will behavior at time. at location. And that's going to be an implementation intention. So like I will work out at 6 p.m. for one hour at my local gym. 12, this is going to be habit stacking. So this is something I use to make sure that I started moisturizing my face more often because uh, Nicole has some better uh, genetics for for aging. Your boy, (laughs) when I'm like 80, you know, I could be pretty wrinkly. I mean, my genetics are not like ideal for aging. So habit stacking, is going to be um, after I current habit, I will new habit. So you're linking two habits together. So for me, what this worked very well for me was I was terrible at flossing. I'm out myself. I was terrible for flossing. I have a dentist appointment tomorrow, but I was terrible at flossing for the first 28 years of my life. I got roasted at the dentist one day and I was like, okay, I should really like figure out like a system for getting this. So one, instead of like the annoying floss that I would pull and like make all the stuff and it was just annoying and not practical, I got those little pick things where it's just super easy to do. And where did I put that? I put it in the environment where I'm already brushing my teeth. So right next to my toothbrush has this this bag of these flossers. So then I started to build a win streak because I made it, I stacked the habits of brushing my teeth, which I never miss. And I stacked that habit with flossing. And I said, before I brush my teeth, I'm going to do this. Habit stacking, same thing in the mornings. Now... Also next to my toothbrush, so now I have like a four to five step morning routine. I have my cologne, which I started wearing. Um, I got my, I got my, my face SPF moisturizer for the morning. So I I do that. It's next to my toothbrush as well. So I made all these things. I stack these habits together of things that I think are going to have a long-term benefit, just like having some moisturizer with that SPF 15 in it. Um, So if there's things you want to, you know, make more of something you do consistently, stack it to something that is already a habit. And that could be useful for you as well. Number 13, we got, ooh, this one's bars. The people with the best self-control are typically the ones who need to use it the least. This is, I'm partial to many of these. But this one really resonated to me. And I think I was listening to some podcasts recently where they're just saying like, and and we even say this in kind of uh, the onboarding uh, conversation we have in HFP. But when it comes to this situation of, of willpower, we all have limited willpower. And so the people that get the most things of like being disciplined people, it's just they use their willpower the least. For me, I set 10 alarms at 4 a.m. to get me out of bed. Um, and I've kind of... Well, now it's pretty routine, but I just make it so easy to go downstairs, eat a quick meal, and then get over to the gym. It's already in my calendar. So it doesn't take willpower to decide when I'm going to train. It's already in my calendar where it's already a decision made. So the less decisions we have to make on the go and have to pick this or that, but if it's if you heard the quote, it's easier to be 100% than 99% because it's just all in. I am going to get the workout done. It's not even a question. When we give ourselves the out sometimes, 
that can make it more difficult. If the food isn't even in the fridge, it's easier to then not have to use willpower to not eat the cookie. So setting up our environment, my biggest takeaway from Atomic Habits is utilize the setup of your environment and set that up for success for yourself. So again, the dental floss next to, next to my toothbrush, the, the vegetables uh, at eye level in the refrigerator, the not cookies in <laughs> staring me in the face every day where I have to willpower use, not eating it every time. So set up your environment and that's going to make sure that you don't have to rely on willpower. You're relying on systems, kind of as we mentioned a little bit earlier. Next up, we got running out of space here. Number 14 is going to be, we crave the expectation of reward. We crave the expectation of reward. That's what sets off dopamine. And this is kind of, this comes to like, why are we such goal setting beings? You hit a goal that you've had for the last five years, you hit it. And then you're just like, okay, what's next? It's usually not as satisfying as we thought it would be. It's just, sometimes it's fun to just have these far arcing goals that you're slowly making progress to. Because like when you get there, it's typically not, it's, it's not, <laughs> it, it can be great. You may have like a nice dinner. You may like throw yourself like a, a party and stuff, but it's typically like it's on to the next thing. You make a new goal and that's kind of what happens. And so this, this kind of, we can play with our own psychology. Like how do we make this um, something we can use kind of human nature to our, to our own, um, to our own success, control our tendencies to see better outcomes. Um, and so that I just found to be very uh, interesting overall. So is there a way where I can reduce the size of this text? We're going to, we're going to figure it out in live. Um, nope. Just change the color. No, we got this. We got this. So we're going to go into number 15. And what number 15 is going to be, is going to be another, it's a quote by Victor Hugo. Boom, here we go. So the next one, number 15, is going to be, actually it's not a quote by Victor Hugo, but he wrote The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And so he locked all of his clothes away, all of his clothes away. So he only wore a shawl, a shawl, a shawl, so that he had no proper clothes to leave the house. So that he, he to, to a degree, he couldn't leave the house because he just didn't have anything to wear because he took a lot of pride in his appearance in terms of what he, he wore. And so because of this, he said that he would not get, he would not be able to unlock the clothes until he completed his book because he noticed that he kept putting off the writing of the book he kept putting off the writing of the book. And so he, he had to use his own nature against himself. So he predetermined his decision. He said, I am not going to allow my, just because I take pride in like the way that, you know, I dress. So when I leave the house, uh, I want to be seen in that way. I can't, I can't have that contrast of my image. So he only put himself in a shawl or something he wouldn't want to be seen wearing in public. And so this made him pretty much lock himself in a room until he finished uh, reading the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and then he was seen, you know, out and about. Probably got some new, new clothes, and was looking, of course, very spiffy afterwards. But this is again, it's predetermining um, kind of our decisions ahead of time. And so, with that being said, my next one, it's going to be number sixteen. Is this the story? Yes. Okay. So, commitment devices. This last one was kind of a commitment device. So, commitment device. And so, this is a story from the Odyssey. So Ulysses from the Odyssey. I think I'm spelling that probably incorrectly, but it's okay. Um, so what happened is a commitment device is locking in your future actions when your mind is right, rather than waiting to see where your desires take you in the moment. Bars. And so the story of Ulysses is he was a sailor, I think, in the, in the, the book. And so what he had his crew do is he tied himself down to like a pole so that he would hear the crying or the singing of the sirens. And he knew that he had that he was going to have that tendency to steer the boat towards the sirens and wreck the whole ship. So he had his team, uh, his his crew tie him back so he would hear these things. And he predetermined that he would not drive the ship into the rocks, into the sirens. And so that kind of just shows us kind of as Victor Hugo did a commitment de device. When our brain is clear and we can make these actions and I have a fitness uh, metaphor on this. When our brain is clear and we can make a rational judgment with our long-term goals in mind, 
do something that locks you into that decision. Fitness context. If you're going out to Cheesecake Factory tonight, rather than wait and see where your desires lead you in that moment, which is probably a 1500 calorie piece of cheesecake because it's delicious. But if we want to lose body fat, we need a calorie deficit. So what you would do before is look at the menu beforehand while you're sitting at home and you're not under, you know, maximum desire. And you can make your decision based on there with like your long-term goals in mind. And you can pre-plug that in to my fitness pal. The decision is already made. So when we make these decisions, kind of like through a commitment device, where we make that decision when our mind is clear and our, our willpower, our discipline's at its highest, Rather than in an environment of desire, you're going to make better decisions. You're going to have better outcomes. And then you just stick with those decisions. So that I've seen, especially with our clients, be very useful for, you know, going out to eat. It's just look at the, and I do this all the time. I look at the menu before I actually go there and I tend to make better decisions because I was able to predetermine those decisions or make them ahead of time. What, number 17, what is immediately rewarded is repeated. What is immediately punished is avoided. So this one's interesting. And I think that the, a lot of people that are into like training dogs or like, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's proximity. So like, let's say, um, let's say your dog, you got a puppy. Um, maybe it's an adult dog. Um, maybe they're like four years old and they pee in the house. But then an hour later, you find it, and then you say, then then you kind of give negative reinforcement. You're like, hey, don't do that. I'm gonna, you gotta go outside now, et cetera, et cetera. And they see you get upset. They're not gonna know what happened in the last hour that they did that made you upset. But when you decrease that, when you decrease that proximity, or I guess, yeah, you make that a closer time frame to okay, you see the dog peeing, and then you're like, no, cannot do that. And then you kind of give negative reinforcement. At least that proximity is there. So the same thing if you're trying to get a good habit in place. I think in the book, um, in the book, they I think there was an example where some people they they wanted to spend less money at restaurants and they wanted to to fund a future vacation. So every time they didn't order or go out to eat, they would put fifty dollars in a jar immediately when that decision got made or that successful decision. So they got this kind of quick feedback loop of like, okay, this feels good. I didn't do the thing. I did what I wanted to do. And then they get the feedback because they see that the, the cash stack up. So that's another piece too, when trying to build those habits, proximity of that positive reinforcement, proximity of negative re reinforcement. So kind of timing becomes pretty important as well. Finally, number 18, the final takeaway I have from atomic habits. Number 18 is going to be the first mistake is never the one that ruins you. It is the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. Missing once is an accident. Missing twice is the start of a new, a new habit. So that one, I think it, there's not much like kind of follow up on that one. That's just bars. So the first mistake is never the one that ruins you. It is the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. Missing once is an accident. Missing twice is the start of a new habit. So it's kind of like there's going to be hiccups along the way, but it's just getting back on track. But when we start having repeated uh, occurrences, repeated events, we start building new habits, new routines. So that's kind of when no formation of a new habit is going to be perfect. But you just have to outweigh kind of um, the the times you step off and just kind of try to maximize you know, the amount of time you're, you're on your game. But remember, habits are being formed regardless if you track them or not. Just like calories count, if you track them or not, um, you're always forming habits. So what we want to do is bring it all the way back to the Carl Jung quote is, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So be aware of your habits. Be aware of what's going on. Be aware that habits are being formed and direct kind of human nature or utilize human nature to your benefit to create the habits that you want to have. So that's going to close out my 18 takeaways from Atomic Habits. Great book. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. Read it because you got fitness goals, business goals, or just goals in life. Very, very great book. So let's get into some Q&A. Let's get it started. All right. Are you currently practicing pharmacy? Are you currently? I didn't even grab a new drink. Oh, man. Are you currently practicing pharmacy? I am not. So I have my, this is kind of fixed, but I have my degree over there 
and it's kind of crooked right now, but that's okay. But I graduated my PharmD in 2018 from Rutgers. Um, so I do have my doctor of pharmacy, um, but I did not get my RPH, which is registered pharmacist. So what happened for me is 2018, I finished rotations and that was like late April. That the day that I finished rotations or the day after I invested in a mentor because my dream job was always being a coach full time. So I invested in a mentor at that time who to try to make, you know, my passion kind of my full time gig. And that ended up working very well. Learned a lot in that time period and was able to kind of take things off and make this kind of the full full time priority. And so very happy about that. Working my dream job. And uh, I'm excited for this has been the first seven years, um, but excited for, you know, what's to come. Um, as far as pharmacy as well, uh, funny things is the what is it, 1,600 hours of um, rotations, which is pretty much you just work. You pay tuition to work full time. Um, for, you do that for about a year. Those credits, I'm pretty sure, do expire. So I can't get my RPH anymore. I would probably be able to work in the industry if I did make that career shift. But it is what it is. Student loans are fun. All right. Hello from Azerbaijan. I have not heard of that place, but I appreciate you being on Hafiz. How are you doing, Kevin? What's going on, Greg? Greg always has the best questions. How are you doing, Kevin? These are excellent videos. Get a lot out of these. I appreciate you, Greg. And you always add and contribute a lot to all the lives I do. So I just want to shout you out. Greg, you are awesome. Always asking great questions. Um, thank you for referencing Jung. Great source of wisdom. Um, for the future, his last name is pronounced Jung. Thank you. Because uh, I did I did learn how to pronounce um, Win, N-G-U-Y-E-N. So I did not know that that was pronounced Jung. So I really appreciate that, actually. This list is great. So important to find a way to get interested in and aware of your success. That looks different for everyone. Absolutely. Um, I think that also like we all kind of, we make the own game of what success is for us. So I find that very interesting too, in a way that sometimes we can set ourselves up for, um, for a lack of success when we set the bar of what we consider success to be. So let's say in this example, I want to lose 10 pounds in 2024. Knock that out in two months, you feel amazing. But someone else on the flip side can just make this barrier of success and say, I want to lose 100 pounds in 2024. Very hard to do in the remaining seven, eight, nine months of the year. So it's kind of setting that, that very high barrier. And then that person may lose 70 pounds, did a better job, did a quote unquote better job than maybe the other person, but they, they may feel defeated just because they set that barrier of success or what success meant to them differently. And so a lot of times we play these mental gymnastics, these mental games, these definitions, these things in our head. And like a lot of times it can keep us from, you know, the beauty of progression. And so that's always something to be aware of. Um, that I think is very, yeah, very important. What do you think of fasting as a jumpstart to a new habit or as a regular practice? Do you use it? Great question. So in form, in terms of fasting, um, I, I do practice it in a fat loss phase. So fasting, everyone, pra so I'll preface this. Everybody is fasting. I am fasting right now because I am not eating. Fasting is a fancy way of just saying don't eat, but it's to what degree in terms of length are we fasting? So we fast between meals. That could be two to four hours. If you do intermittent fasting, these tend to be 16, you know, 12 to 16 hour fasts. Um, people may fast for religious reasons as well. Sun, what is it? Sun up to sundown. Um, so there's different reasons. But in terms of fasting, it just it's, it's a word to say don't eat. And so as a jumpstart for fat loss, if we, if we have more time not eating, we increase that time. It's probably all things else equal. I think that you're going to be more likely to reach a calorie deficit and lose fat. So I think that that can be very effective overall. It can be useful, but it's not the whole game at play. And some people miss the forest for the trees. Yes, miss the forest for the trees. Um, where they think that fasting is the, the end all be all. I have to fast and that's the way I'm going to lose fat. When like you could fast 16 hours a day and not lose weight because you just eat a ton in the other eight hours. So if, if I'm successfully fasting, but I'm not losing weight, then I'm playing the wrong game. Kind of as we said earlier, it's the games we play in our head and what we did, what we kind of associate with success. Fasting is not the goal or not what's going to lose weight. It can be a tool to help a calorie deficit be more reasonable and doable, but it's not the reason we actually lose weight. We need a calorie deficit. So kind of be that if you're having, you know, a, a six hour feeding time or a 10 hour feeding time or a normal 16 hour feeding time where you have meals where you're actually consuming calories 
Uh, it depends on what the magnitude of total calories you actually consume are. And so the way that I use fasting for me when I'm in a calorie deficit is I will often wake up in the morning, I'll eat a pre-training meal, I'll come back from training, I will eat something and I usually will fast for like five hours or so. So I get back at seven, I'll fast until 12 p.m. or 2 p.m. And then that just gives me this big gap of time where I'm gonna not eat calories and I'm, I get a positive association with hunger. I think fasting is great because it gives us a mental association with hunger where it's like, I expect to be uncomfortable. I expect to be hungry. And in a 24 hour period of time, when we're trying to reach a calorie deficit, having a little bit of hunger is actually useful. It's positive reinforcement. You're probably reaching into the bank account of energy storage, fat tissue, and that you're actually gonna be losing weight. Because take, take the opposite. If you are stuffed all day and you don't feel any hunger, you just went to the all you can eat buffet three times in one day. If you're feeling full all day, you're probably not going to lose weight. Probably not. But I mean, if you're doing it with like celery and watermelon, you may lose weight still. Um, so that's kind of my opinion on fasting. I think it's a great tool to utilize, the tool that I still do utilize, but it's not the, it's not the target, it is not the goal. The goal is a calorie deficit for fat loss. Um, then someone's going to say, autophagy. Being in a calorie deficit gets you autophagy. It allows you to kill the weak, weak immune cells in your body and you get the fresh ones. I was late, so you may have covered this, but in your business, what are some things you do to stay organized and make sure you're reaching out to everyone and not forgetting anyone who, when you have a lot? So this can be internally with the team and this can be externally with all our clients. So we do a great, I think we do a good job. I think there's always room for improvement, but we have multiple kind of Google spreadsheets where we're all putting in, uh, entering data just to make sure that there's consistent touch points uh, and we've tried to kind of, as we said, in Atomic Habits, it's systems. Systems are very important. So I think we're coming up on this next this next uh, month. It's going to be quarterlies. <laughs> so just at our internal retreat, now we got quarterlies coming up. Um, but scheduling that, making sure that we have a touch point with every member of the team, as well as you know, on our sheets, our spreadsheets, making sure everyone, 100% of clients get 100% of touch points, 100% of weeks, because communication is key, especially when it comes to habit formation, feeling supported, and making sure that, you know, you feel one of our initiatives too with our clients is they feel we're there, we care, and we're taking them somewhere. So they know we're in their corner. They know that we care about like their results. And of course that uh, we're taking them somewhere, helping set the vision. And a quote that I like, which actually, um, it is sometimes you must climb the hill, which you thought was a mountain to see the, the true mountain worth climbing. So sometimes for a lot of our clients, and this comes to like, we're taking somebody somewhere. Sometimes we thought that the mountain in front of us, uh, until we actually climb it, we realize it was a hill. So for a lot of our clients, it may be losing the first 10, 15 pounds. Once we climb that hill, we then get to see like, okay, what is the real goal we're in here for? Some people that's, okay, I want to lose 30 pounds. I want to you know, enhance my energy. I want to be stronger. And then they get to play a different game and climb a new hill, which they didn't even think possible at that time because their vision was obstructed by that hill. So it's important to help set a vision for you know, your team, uh, clients, et cetera. Um, but very important, just like having systems in place, automated systems even better, uh, and manual systems as well. So that's kind of how we do it uh, in HFP. Hello. How can I get personal advisory from you? I don't really do personal advisory, but you can apply to join the HFP. In terms of like fitness context, you can apply to join the HFP program um, through the link in my bio on Instagram or just go to heinousy.com slash coaching. You can apply to join uh, the HFP program. So if that's a fitness, personal advisory outside of that, I don't really do any mentorship or anything like that at this time. Uh, I think I still have to write a, an interesting life before I'm writing any books. Uh, I think that it's been a cool last five years, but there's, I think, a lot more that I think I have to prove and do. Um, could be a limiting belief, but uh, I think a quote that I really liked was by, oh, uh, why is he? Ryan Holiday. And I think he was talking of the author, uh, Robert Greene, I think it was, where they were saying, if you want to be an author, if you want to, you know, be a mentor, et cetera, you have to live an awesome life. You have to do really cool things that you can go back and like write stuff about. The book that I want to read next is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And the, the Stoics actually were like, they're pretty badass people. They were, they were doing a lot of, um, they were like high level wrestlers, hunters, et cetera. They were doing difficult things. So they had a lot of life experience to then give perspective on. So I feel like for me, I just turned 30. There's a lot more life perspective I feel that I need to earn um, over these, this next decade or so. Um, but yeah, uh, but something that I'm learning this year is going to be a couple um, public speaking events, which I'm very excited for. Uh, next one is going to be in two weeks. It's going to be my first real public speaking opportunity. Uh, and I'm going to be doing that at Champ Dev Live 
uh, for my mentor's company. I've done snorkeling, snorkeling as a fitness respect. Love it. Have I done snorkeling as a fitness? I have snorkeled before. I've snorkeled in Bermuda in 60, 69 degree weather. Nice. But it was, uh, it was not that nice. It was very cold. And that was actually me bringing the HFP team. <laughs> and so it was one of those, um, what's it called? Yeah, I brought, I brought us out there and uh, it's, it wasn't ideal snorkeling weather, but you know, everybody on the team was a trooper. We got the experience, but uh, you know, ideally you'd rather have some nice warm weather to do that and not go to Bermuda in uh, the dead of winter. So no Easter candy on the menu. Now we got Easter candy on the menu. Your boy's going to be bulking for another month. Um, so it's on my menu, but if you're in a fat loss phase, you may have to moderate that Easter candy. Um, but I got peeps in the freezer. So let me know if peeps are, are the play because I keep uh, peeps in the freezer. Uh, I think that's where they're optimal ult ultimately. Frog, Frog Mad Max, what's your job? So I host the HFP, Healthy Flesh Prescription um, Transformation Program. So you can apply for that. It's a fitness coaching company. Uh, and so what we do is we help people lose um, at least 15 pounds of body fat in 16 weeks or less without swearing off the fun things in life like ice cream and their favorite foods like Easter candy as well. But also what we're looking to do is help people build a lifestyle fitness, not just a quick fix type program. So if you're interested in that, go to the link in my bio and you can apply. Can you lose fat and build muscle at the same time? Absolutely. Many of our clients have uh, and have and are. Um, but some of the big pieces that play into that is how new you are to training. If you're very new to training, you'll, you'll gain muscle doing pretty much anything. Um, so if you're new to training, like you mean a calorie deficit, and that's the big thing that's going to dictate if you're going to lose fat just being a calorie deficit. If you're having sufficient protein while in a calorie deficit and you're strength training, you're putting, you're stacking the, the, the votes in the box for building muscle while you lose fat. Um, but also it's more likely if you're higher in body fat. So let's say you're like 30 or 40% body fat coming down from there. You're going to be more likely just because body fat is a more plentiful resource for you to, to lose fat because your body is so giving of that and it's not really giving of muscle. But if you're like six or 10% body fat, this is where it becomes more difficult to lose fat while building muscle just because fat is such a minimal resource that your body is like kind of more protective of it. And, and then muscle mass starts to look a little bit less, uh, uh, less like something it wants to keep around. It's just like, oh, this, we got calories over here too because we don't have much fat. So we got some muscle to give. Um, but ultimately, even if you do lose some some muscle in a fat loss phase, it comes back very, very quick. So I'm never scared of losing muscle in a, uh, a fat loss phase um, because once you get into a surplus again, you recapture it very, very quickly. Typical back breakfast, two scoops of pea science protein. I mix that with a little bit of water into a protein pudding. And I just add a little bit of um, cereal on top. Often I like that really cheap s'more cereal that comes in the bag, one of my favorites. And then the last two days I've been doing cinnamon toast crunch, which is probably... We, when we had our internal retreat this last weekend, me and the team, we were kind of voting on what is the best, what is the best, uh, um, cereal of all time. And the two big ones that came out were cinnamon toast crunch and Reese's puffs. It's a tight battle, but I think the cinnamon toast crunch took the cake. Um, I'm gonna take two more questions, three more questions. Cause two are quick. That's a good, <laughs> no. all right. I don't know why you asked me that one, but I'm gonna take these last three and then I'm going to close up. What is your favorite? No, what's yeah. That's the first one. Wait, so it's Dr. Hainis? Technically, yes. Technically, it is Dr. Kevin Hainis, Farm D. But like, I'm not, I'm not going to be one of those people who are like, address me as doctor. No, like, it's, it's just a, a cool thing. Um, what is your favorite self improvement book or suggestion? Um, favorite self improvement book? Um, what would I say? Um, I'd say my top three of all time. So probably in this list. Success principles. Well, I'll put these in this thing. Um. I don't think I've updated this, but just like, I'll give you some of my favorites off the top of my head. Um, so I'm going to delete these. So this, this is in no particular order because I have to reevaluate the order. So success principles. This was Jack Canfield. This was the first book that taught me about um, uh, taking ownership of like everything. And I feel like that has been one of the most useful things. It's just been very empowering for me personally, uh, which leads me into the next one, extreme ownership. Uh, Jocko Willink. I hope I spelled that wrong, right. And Leaf Babin, Leaf Babin. I think I, I hope I spelled that one right as well. Three, uh, this was a great book. Uh, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter. This was uh, 50 Cent. So Curtis Jackson. Um, Atomic Habits is definitely going to be probably up here. I don't, uh, yeah, I just, I'm going to put it on there. It was really good. 
um, Atomic Habits. And what else did I really, really like? Um, in my all time greatest books that I've read. Um, do I have my list here? Nope. I don't think I do, but those are, those are a couple of the ones that I would say, uh, have been very impactful for me. Um, yeah, I'm probably going to lock these ones in. No, 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 no. Okay. That I knew that I was waiting for one. This one's a banger. The one thing. Whew, almost missed that one. Almost missed that one. But yes, The One Thing by Gary Keller is a tremendous book. And kind of just the concept's amazing. Because uh, it's just like pretty much no matter what you're doing, be 100% on The One Thing. So right now, The One Thing is me doing this. And I'm not focusing about, you know, text messages I have to get back to, uh, you know, setting up Easter stuff for this weekend or anything else. It's just focus on The One Thing. What is the priority? But your priority is also uh, specific to like the time that you're in. So I thought that was really, really useful. Um, and then finally, we're going to close out with this one. Do you give any fashion advice? Curious if you know any good companies that make leather jackets for guys who do bodybuilding, et cetera. Actually, one of my buddies, uh, Charlton, Charlton, he is um, he is on Instagram. And I think that he was making some leather garments. He's a really big, beefy bodybuilder. Um, and so Charlton Banks. Uh, and so he... Um, I think it's like Falcon garments. And I think he does leather jackets and stuff. Uh, so you may be able to find him, but do I give fashion advice? I'm the last person you want fashion advice from because your boy is just rocking my teal, my, what would you say? We're turqu my turquoise Crocs as I walk around and that's pretty much it. And that it's like that and like tank tops. Um, so I'm the last person you probably want to get advice from, but if I had one go-to, it's going to be my Merino wool banana Republic quarter zips. And that's like, and Lululemon ABC pants. Those are the goats. Like if I'm ever trying to like not look like a bum, which I typically always am, uh, I'm going to wear those. But that's going to do it for FlexRx episode four. Really good questions today. Gave a pretty long topic. Hope you guys got some value from it. But I will see you guys next week. I believe I'm going to be same time EST. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.